So how long have you been at uh, Richmond Equestrian Centre? So we brought Richmond Equestrian Centre in summer 2018 and uh, hit the ground running when we bought it. Um, we had our first horse trials about three months after we ran, uh, after we bought it. Um, and we were running the livery yard. I think we had about 55 liveries on at the time when we, when we bought the place. And 2019, um, that's when we, summer 2019, that's when we got the strangles. Came knocking. Came knocking, mm. yeah. It was uh, a shock. We'd spent a long time, when, when we bought the centre, we spent a long time um, knocking bits down and rebuilding and cleaning it all. So we just yeah. never even thought that we would get strangles. It just yeah, wasn't yeah. on the radar at all. We thought we were doing everything right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah. So on, on day one, yeah. when you when strangles came to Richmond, uh, how did you find out? So I remember... It, we were, I was in the office and we were planning for, so it was August time and we were planning for our September horse trials heavily because I think we had about two weeks, two or three weeks to go. Um, and one of the girls had said her horse had a bit of a snotty nose. And we immediately said, right, put it in isolation. Um, we'll get the vet out. I think we put it in isolation, took its temperature, realised it was high got the vet out and they said they're going to test for strangles and we just thought well it won't be strangles because it can't be that the horse in question had actually been on box rest for six was it about six I think it was four months it had been on box rest for and um you know people were mentioning strangles but we all everybody just well it won't be strangles it must be something else and the next day when um the vet came and said it's actually tested positive for strangles we just could not believe it. Um, God, it's like yesterday and it's, it was 2019. Mm. Um, Makes an impression, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that word and positive, it was just... So immediately um, we just had to forget about the horse trials and everything and mm. just <laughs> lock down. And we, we at the time we had, um, when we bought the place, we inherited um, people that were running our actual arena centre. So we were running the field events, they were running the centre. Um, and we had to tell them they had to be locked down. Um, we put it, we did put it out on social media straight away because we just wanted to, to let everybody know. Um, we isolated that one horse already, any other horses that, that horse had been near or had been in contact with were also isolated. Um, panic did set in. <clears throat> um, a girl that worked for me at the time was fantastic and we got in touch with Red Wings because obviously they had their big outbreak mm. and they were fantastic in, in just telling us how to manage the yards and everything. Um, our vet was brilliant and we just we made rules from, we just made a plan straight away. Mm. Um, a lot of the clients were panicking. It, it was awful because we had to, I mean, it, several people did tell us, don't say anything, it'll blow over in a couple of weeks, it'll be fine, mm. just turn the horses away. And I just thought, how can you, we, we had, I think we had about 750 horses coming for the horse trials in a fortnight's time. Yeah. And for us to not say anything and allow 750 horses to come to our facilities mm -hmm. where we knew we had one horse at that time. It turned out we had six all together, mm -hmm. including that horse. I think the same as you. About same as us, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, you've got a duty of care. You can't just... So anyway, we were very public <clears throat> about it. Yeah. And um, it did take... Like you, we had one horse that just couldn't seem to shift it, so it took yeah. took a while. But I think f from start to finish, it was nine weeks. Right. But we were shut. Um, we lost our horse trials, which was devastating. Mm. We didn't. Our insurance um, didn't cover us for yeah. strangles. Yeah. Uh, the stress, the stress with the li the livery clients. It was. I never thought it would. Every day just seemed like to last forever, and I just. Couldn't yeah. see, but you yeah. just got to stick with the plan and um, and be open and honest and communicate with everybody. Yeah, um, yeah. was key. The the timeline of us finding out was uh, a 
um, a livery had had a uh, horse with a snotty nose. And a bit like you, none of us really wanted to believe it could be strangles mm. because we, we believe we had a solid quarantine Clean process. Yard and yeah. Um, so when a horse came in with a snotty nose, uh, the, the livery didn't want to believe it um, mm. and was attempting to self-treat with uh, antihistamines for um, hay fever or some al uh, allergic reaction. And uh, it was only when a, a member of our staff organised um, a swab to, to be taken for that horse that was sent off to be yeah. tested. It was taken on the Monday, results back on the Tuesday. And uh, um, the, res the results came back and the, the livery in question um, told the yard manager and uh, the yard manager told my wife and um, uh, I was at work I, I have a day job I, I work up in Newcastle and uh, um, I got a phone call from Heidi no more than 10 or 15 minutes after the first um, uh, 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 the first information got to her uh, but I already knew that we had strangles and I already knew because uh, a person on Facebook had already written to the Ivesley Facebook page to ask for a refund for their competition entry for that for the, um, the one day event that mm. weekend. So the livery who um, had the positive results had put that on Facebook and it had just run yeah. straight away. Yeah. And um, I, I'm, not, I'm not bothered about that, no. uh, but, what, but it, what it indicates is how fast news spreads. Yeah particularly bad news. Yeah, yeah, it spreads unbelievably quickly. Mm -hmm. And if, if you as a centre, like you, 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 you did the same thing that we did, we went, went public. Mm -hmm. As soon as we had a message, we went public. Because otherwise people will fill that information vacuum with yeah. rumours yeah. and with gossip yeah. and with you wouldn't believe what's happened there, you wouldn't yeah. believe what they've done and yeah. blah, blah, blah. So we really needed to control that narrative mm -hmm. early on. Um, so uh, I went home from work um, and then Heidi and I met around around this table where we are now with um, with the vet and we made a plan mm -hmm. um, and uh, we you know the plan involved using as far as possible just one vet practice mm -hmm. to coordinate everything um, it involved getting everybody on board with doing the same thing yeah. and we did that by um, getting the right information to the liveries. Yeah. So in this age of the internet and the encyclopedia of Google, um, anyone can find anything that they want on any, su on any subject. Um, and you can find any opinion that you want. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're really conscious about making sure that we got the information that we were using yeah. out to everyone. Yeah. So everyone could hopefully come to the same yeah. conclusion as us about, mm. about the way forward. And, um, and by and large, that worked. Yeah. Uh, so it was a matter of making a plan, uh, communicating that plan to the liveries and to uh, uh, other people coming to, for, for competitions here and to the public at large. Uh, and, to, and, and also, most importantly, to, to, to our staff. Mm -hmm. Because the st you, know, you hear the word strangles as, a, as an equestrian and it's, it, oh, is, you know, yeah. it, it sets the fear of God into you. Yeah. And... Um, uh, obviously, the staff themselves would be worried about their horses, mm -hmm. about their jobs potentially, mm -hmm. um, and uh, they needed to know that, that there was a plan, mm -hmm. and they needed the assurance that we were on it, and we, and we weren't just going to ignore it. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it was pretty. It worked pretty well. Um, we had a meeting a couple of days later with all the liveries, well, most of the liveries, and uh, went through what we decided to do, and. They asked a lot of very sensible questions. Yeah, you know, people aren't naturally anxious about the proposed plan, the mm. proposed treatment. Um, we isolated all of our horses in herds out in the fields. It was the summer time mm. that worked well for us. Yeah. We felt that rather than bring horses into the buildings, we keep them out in the fields. I know that that may or may not work for everyone, but that's what worked for mm. us. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the, the horses stayed out in their fields, uh, but of course that brings problems of you know, potential la laminitic issues, mm, yeah. um, 
horses getting fat, horses go getting you know, hard to catch over time. Um, but everyone was in the same boat. Nobody was happy with it. We just all had to get yeah. on. And to be fair to our liveries, everyone did. Yeah. But it was having that clarity, I think, of message early on for yeah. us that made the difference. Mm-hmm. Um, and it meant that when we found out from that first positive test result, we already had all of the cases we were going to get. Yeah. All that happened then was the cases began to present themselves over the next few days. So yeah. there's no additional spreading after that first day. Yeah. Which we're really proud about, actually. Yeah. And it was yeah. quite an achievement yeah. given the number of people and the number yeah. of horses involved. Yeah. Um, and that's, that, that, I think, is down to, yeah, communicating the message and cooperation yeah. so that everyone knew what was expected of them. Um, yeah. And I, you know, yeah, we had exactly the same, the one... We have three separate yards and um, because we'd isolated this one horse, we knew which others it had been in touch with um, and we kind of guessed which ones would get it and they did. Some in that yard didn't get it. Um, but yeah, it's just having that plan and, and having the resources to understand the disease and how it works yeah. so you can predict almost what is going to happen. Um, and just keep all the other horses safe and, and look after those ones that are potentially going to come down with it. Because we were lucky, we, we just had the snotty noses, we didn't have any abscesses. Um, but I know that, you know, some horses die from it, so you've got to be, it's a serious disease. One of the things that we noticed was the, the variation in symptoms. Yeah. That we had some horses that were scarcely affected, they had mm-hmm. a snotty nose, maybe they there, uh, there was a bit of malaise for a few days, but they recovered pretty quickly. Yeah. And then we had two horses that were really badly affected. We had, we had, we had, we had no deaths, thankfully. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we could have had at least one. Right. Um, because one horse had the, um, the internal um, strangles that actually constrict the trachea. So yeah. he couldn't breathe and had to be intubated and sent off to Rainbow in in Moulton and that mm-hmm. that could have been very very serious mm-hmm. and um, <clears throat> the the other horse um, had the external lesions right. and which was obviously really unpleasant to look at and mm-hmm. unpleasant to manage in the yeah. summer with outside with all the flies mm-hmm. um, but to be fair the owner was was really stoic and was a a force of nature and yeah. she she just had to persist yeah. with her horse and persist with the management of the symptoms the management of these 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 awful wounds and um you know she would turn up on a morning before everyone else arrived mm-hmm. she'd wear ppe she wouldn't really talk to anyone definitely wouldn't hug anyone even yeah. though all she wanted was a hug yeah <laughs> um yeah. and just kept herself to herself and she had to do that for months yeah. And this horse just couldn't shift it for, for, for a long time. And for us as a, for us as a business watching this, you know, um, being told by a vet that you need to wait for a month, for example, yeah. in between treatments is extremely frustrating. Yeah, because a day was long enough, but for exactly. like a month, yeah. Because uh, all of that time, your business is hemorrhaging money. You're mm-hmm. not you're not getting new liveries in, you're not getting people coming to hire facilities because yeah. you've got strangles. Yeah. And there's yeah. a, um, a widely held perception that even if there's only one case of strangles on your yard, then no one should go there. Yeah. Um, which, are, which I accept at the start of, a, of, a, of an outbreak. Yeah. Because the problem is not so much the cases you do know about, it's the cases that you don't. Yeah. Um, and not knowing where those horses have been and not knowing where there might be infection material. But after a while, when, when you know, we, after three or four weeks, we knew the status yeah. of every horse's guttural pouches on this farm, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, which puts us in a pretty good position. Yeah. Um, so we then felt able to open up and allow people to come back. But uh, um, is it, it's interesting that as much as People were reluctant to come here because they they knew we had a, still had a, had a live case of strangles. We were actually really reluctant. I think you mentioned this before as well. 
we were really reluctant to have people come here. Yes. Because we don't know their status. Yes. So how did the outbreak affect your business? Um, so because we were just two weeks off running our big British event in horse trials in September of 2019, for that event we actually uh, had record numbers and we were really looking forward to it. We had um, loads of sponsors. Um, the weather forecast even looked good, so we were really excited about mm. it. And then when the strang when we had the positive strangles, obviously we we dealt with that initially and brought up a plan. And then we had to look at BE, contact BE. We looked at maybe could we run the horse trials? Could because the horse trials were actually away from the centre, but then mm. the show jumping phase was up near the livery yards, and it just wasn't it wasn't viable. It wasn't sensible, and we didn't feel comfortable. Um, so we just had to cancel it. So we that the horse trials that we classed that as our with being farmers, big harvest, and we lost it, and it mm. was just devastating. Um, so financially, it was um, awful, absolutely awful. Um, that was our big bread and butter input yep. for the whole farm. Obviously, the people that were um, running the arenas at the time, they had to shut down, so it was devastating for them. Um, and I don't know if you found that when you did actually get the all clear and reopened, several livery clients left. <laughs> um, yep. So, yep. obviously, losing out financially there, and you still have a business to run, um, but you haven't got the money coming in to run it. Yep. Um, our insurance didn't cover us for um, strangled, yeah. um, which, you know, we hadn't read the small print with regards to it. But I guess at the same time, we never, ever in a million years thought we ever mm. would get strangled. So it really is important that um, you, you've just got to, to be so clued up on your biosecurity. And you're only as strong as your weakest point, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we, we, we had the same. So, um, obviously, the very first time I found out about the outbreak was somebody asking for a refund on Facebook, mm. only about 50 minutes after it was identified. Yeah. And um, for weeks afterwards, we just hemorrhaged cash, yeah. um, issuing refunds, but also, and um, I guess your your costs of setting up events are higher than ours. Mm -hmm. um, but we, we obviously spent weeks preparing a cross country course. So yeah. that's weeks of staff time, materials, tons of stone, tons yeah. of gravel, tons of sand, mm -hmm. um, new cross country jumps, yeah. the works. And then you're not left with the income in yeah. to make that up. And yes, we lost a lot of livery clients and uh, we lost about a third of our liveries. And I, I think that's for, a variety of reasons. Yeah. I I suspect that some people didn't like being told what to do. Mm -hmm. um, as part of managing an outbreak, we, we simply had to tell people what to do and had mm. to run a really tight ship. And I think some people didn't enjoy that very much. Uh, but also I think the kind of shared trauma that you go through with a an outbreak, because it stresses everyone out. Mm -hmm. I think it just makes some people reevaluate their situation, reevaluate yeah. their choices and um, move elsewhere, which mm -hmm. is fine. Yeah. Um, uh, the the irony is is that many of them move to yards with no biosecurity policies, mm -hmm. uh, which is a bit galling. Yeah. Um, and their yards would have benefited from our livery arriving, knowing where they came from and knowing that they're clean mm -hmm. um, into a yard where potentially that livery doesn't know the status of all the horses there. Um, and the same as you, our insurance. Um, didn't cover us, so we 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 had bit well, we have business continuity insurance. Yeah. Uh, we also had event cancellation insurance as well, um, and we were covered if we were hit by an asteroid strike or um, or a flood or a fire, but we weren't covered for infectious disease. And the guy from the insurance company was terribly polite and terribly mm -hmm. apologetic yeah. and really really empathised with us and sympathised, but. He wasn't going to pay us any money. No. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say um, 
kind of need to layer up on your protection, don't you, as a yeah. as a as a as a, as a business and as a as a family. Mm-hmm. I mean, we we're lucky here because we we own the place. We, mm-hmm. we we don't have a mortgage. We don't have rent to pay. But the amounts of money involved w- were and continue to be mm-hmm. you know, four or five months on significant. Yeah, and it's not unrealistic to think that if we had a mortgage to pay as well, we could have lost our home. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and and then it's not just your business and it, and, and your livelihood, but your yeah. but your home as well, or at least mm-hmm. selling some land. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it's had a had a profound effect on us mm-hmm. too, and uh, it it really underlines the importance of um, layering up your protection, both in terms of biosecurity and yeah. management of liveries. Um, and, and and people coming on competitions and making sure they've all got the right information and up to date information, mm-hmm. but also as a business protecting yourself, making sure you've read the small print uh, yeah. for the insurance. I mean, we the business continuity insurance coverage for um, disease is available. Mm-hmm. It's obviously more expensive, but f- to be honest, it wasn't top of mind for us. I don't think that was I didn't I think we just took out our insurance but we didn't we were obviously told that it wouldn't be covered for strangles but there was no mm. they never mentioned about um paying more for a better right. policy they just said no it was okay. we didn't do it so we have since changed insurance company oh, right. okay. uh just in case it does ever happen again yeah. hopefully fingers crossed it won't yeah but um you've just got to yeah, you've got to read up on it and make sure you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it it was on top of mind for us because we we felt we had a solid yeah biosecurity policy yeah. and we felt that we were pretty hot on it. Yeah. And I, and I still maintain that we we were and are pretty hot on mm. it, but not hot enough. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So have you made any any changes to your uh, biosecurity oh, yes. processes uh, since since strangles so, came? So after in? after we had strangles. Um, that would have been, I think we reopened in the October 2019 uh, and then got going for a little bit. And then, of course, we all got COVID in the yeah. March 2020. Yeah. So it was like a double whammy. That was great. But um, when we did have COVID and we shut down and um, our um, the people that were renting our arena facilities, actually their contract had ended and they moved on. So we then during COVID took over the arena facilities and um, we kind of blitzed everything again. And we, um, I think a lot of it is, you've got to keep up to date with everything. Having been to your talk last night and learning more, you've just got to keep up to date all the time yeah. um, with how things, you know, how the, the scientists and the professionals are learning more and more about yeah. this disease. You've got to educate yourself as well as a livery yard yeah. owner. Well, things um, change all the time, don't all the they? Time. But also, as a business, you've got to balance the avenue between mm-hmm. biosecurity and being safe, mm-hmm. and also the practicalities of it. Because yeah. imagine being told you're a livery, as a, as a livery, that you've got to wait for three weeks mm-hmm. with your horse in an isolation stable, an isolation paddock on its own, mm-hmm. and you can't use the facilities that you're paying money for. Uh, you can't really enjoy it to the full. And you've also got a couple of vets bills. You've got, you've got to balance it out. Keep in mind, we're also in competition with people who don't do any of this. Yes. And yeah. we're regarded as the party poopers. Yeah. And those, you know, those guys down the road are having a huge amount of fun on their yard when they come yeah. and go and no, no testing or anything. And um, um, what I can say is that they're, they're riding their luck. Mm-hmm. And um, uh, you, you only have to be unlucky once. Yeah. So while you were kind of trying to navigate your way through this outbreak were you given any bad advice by people uh i think the worst bit of advice and it came from several people um was we shouldn't have said anything which is just ridiculous in my eyes and um the horse in question or the horses in question just turn them away for a couple of weeks in a field leave them and they'll be absolutely fine after that which some horses would be and they'd get over it but what if one of those horses became a carrier which is Mm. what a lot of people don't know about so where the horse will present as being fit and healthy and normal no temperature 
but it's in its guttural pouch there are a million chondroids where the, the strangles is just sat. Saying that a horse that's had strangles, turn it away for a couple of weeks and then it'll be fine. You don't know if that horse has become a car It might present as being fine afterwards, but you don't know if that horse mm. has actually become a carrier. And that's how it all starts again. But it's between a quarter and a third of horses become carriers, yeah. don't they? Yeah. And you just so, can't see, you, you can't tell from you the can't outside. Tell. Yeah. And the, the, the bacteria can at any point decide to reappear yeah. from that horse and you've got no control over it yeah. and no time over it. I mean, it's like a ticking time bomb, isn't it? Yeah. And that's when, you know, we don't know the horses that arrive at Richmond Equestrian Centre for competitions. You know, we've got some fantastic clients, but we don't know their horses. And when they bring the horses and they get off the wagons and they start eating the grass that's near the, the wagon park, sometimes some of them will let them into our... <laughs> Livery paddock, so we've um, mm -hmm. buckled up on that. Um, that horse, if they, they don't know, it, it could be a carrier and it's secreting the, the strangles yeah. into the grass. Another horse comes along, eats the grass. So it's all, you've got to kind of, it's all the biosecurity that you've got to think about all the time. Yeah, but a lot of it of is it's quite basic, isn't it? The yeah. biosecurity, and a lot of it's just, you, you'd think it's common sense, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, it's set, Keeping your horse separate from others, and it's uh, making sure they're not sharing a drink. I mean, would you would you share some random stranger's pint in the pub? Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, not, I'm not sure you would. So why would you let your horse do it? It's uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it is peculiar what people think is acceptable. Yeah, um, and safe. Yeah, and you, it's a really good point about the grass, doesn't it? Because yeah. you're when you arrive at a competition, you don't know who's been in that field prior. And it's lovely for them to think they can get the horse off the wagon. It's had, they've had a long journey. Give them a walk around. Let them put their head down and have a nibble of grass. Yeah. Yeah. Just take a hair net with you and. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's yeah. so, so easy to do, isn't it? Yeah. You know, it, yeah. it, it, a lot of the measures that we found helped us during the outbreak were just really basic things. Yeah. It's just keeping horses separate. It's having boot washes, hand washes, and actually. The, the experience of COVID helped a, yeah, a lot of people but, yeah. because it all had it drilled into us about the importance of hand washing and hygiene. Mm -hmm. And while some of us, I think, had a touch of PTSD from COVID, and, and, and certainly some people reacted in the same way, the, the awareness of hygiene and hand washing was, were, was really valuable in controlling it. And I think that will also continue going yeah. forward. Yeah. So, so what's about professionals coming onto your yard? Have you had to change anything about the way that they, they work? Or have you had to put any extra rules in place? Um, so with our livery clients, as well as going through the contract and the rules with them, we also ask them to take out the Red Wings Horse Sanctuary Stamp Out Strangles Pledge as a horse owner. And that just um, gives them some literature through the post, really good booklet to read up on about strangles. Um, and we also helped Red Wings with... Um, producing the equine professional pledge as well. Mm -hmm. So that's for farriers, saddle fitters, nutritionalists, physios, anybody dealing with horses, basically. We all mm -hmm. have a part to play to, to help yeah. with the biosecurity of, of, and making sure we don't, it, it's not just strangles, <coughs> but you know, passing diseases from yard to yard, people mm -hmm. have to um, disinfect. Yeah, one, one thing that was remarkable at the start of our outbreak was, and I think you had the same, was the number of equestrian professionals who came to us to ask which horses were infected because they'd been up that day. Yeah. And for me, it kind of spoke volumes about their biosecurity themselves mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that they, they clearly knew that they weren't acting in a totally biosecure way. We don't want to stop people trading here. No. You know, we, we need farriers to come here, we need vets to come here, we need saddle fitters to come here, back mm -hmm. people, all these people need to come here. And we're totally fine with that, but what we're not cool with is people bringing diseases from yard yeah. to yard. Prevention's better than cure at the end of the day. Yep, so as well as uh, Richmond Equestrian Centre, your family's also owned cattle, a cattle farm. Yeah. Um, how have you found the um, the biosecurity measures uh, that vets and professionals take in the cattle and food production 
industry versus equest the, the equestrian in industry? Yeah, um, a lot different. Uh, when Andrew had the cattle at our other farm, um, I always remember the vets coming and it was there was really strict biosecurity in place with overalls and uh, washing down and everything. Even maybe it's from the foot and mouth days. Um, obviously, cattle farming and everything that's heavily regulated, but uh, and the horse industry isn't. But um, yeah, the the vets would turn up. I remember one day a vet turning up, and we had um, I think it was a, a heifer that had broken its legs. So there was no disease involved, but uh, she automatically got out of the car, clean overalls and everything. Had, sadly, had to put the uh, heifer to sleep and got back in the car, scrubbed down and everything before she did. So there was real strict biosecurity there. The only time I've ever seen that at Richmond Equestrian Centre uh, has been when we've had strangles. Mm -hmm. Now that you're over strangles, um, you obviously have a lot of liveries here who will go to other competitions and places, possibly yeah. Richmond. Um, Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> how, how do you feel about them leaving the facilities and coming back, especially if they're going somewhere and having an overnight, overnight stay somewhere yeah. and then coming back to Ivesley? Yeah. Well, I mean, obviously... After dealing with strangles, we, we, we don't want anyone going anywhere. No. <laughs> we yeah. don't want anyone coming here. Yeah. Um, but you know, people need to enjoy their horses. And um, us as a, a, as a centre needs to try and strike that balance between giving people the flexibility of going where they want to go, but also keeping both them safe and also the other horses here safe because we've got a number of clients who don't go anywhere. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so our feeling is that um, the developments in, in, in the vaccine, which over recent years have been huge, mm -hmm. um, could give us this route where vaccinated horses are allowed to leave the yard and come back, but also horses that don't go anywhere could also be vaccinated so that should someone go away and come back, and they happen to come back with strangles on their clothing or their hands or whatever, mm -hmm. they can't then bring it back to their, their friends back home. So we, we see the strangles vaccine as being potentially another layer to add to the biosecurity defences around the yard yeah. and also as a, as a way of perhaps allowing us to be more flexible around movements and yeah. sharing transport and yeah. quarantine and all the rest of it. So we, we see it as being potentially mm. a massive step forward. We're well up for yeah. the vaccine. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, without, without wanting to appear to be shilling for big pharma, which, you know, which is the, the thing that goes around the internet, isn't it? Um, I, I, I can't see why you wouldn't want no. to. I think it's something we'll definitely be looking at just for that extra layer. Extra yeah. layer of protection. So obviously we have our facilities and people come all the time to hire the arenas or competitions and it's just protecting yeah. if something something does come and happens to be a carrier and they don't know and strangles is about at least we're protected. Yeah, because wouldn't it be that nice extra layer? Wouldn't it be nice to have that comfort that yeah. if a if a competitor goes from your yard goes away and comes back or a visitor comes, mm -hmm. you know that if they bring strangles with them, and they might not know they bring strangles yeah. with them. I don't think anyone knowingly travels with no. strangles, but if it arrives at your yard, it's stopped dead. Yeah. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah. And then we can, and, and then we can all enjoy yeah. our horses and stop this disease from circulating round and round and round yeah. because there's nothing there to stop it. Yeah.